welcome everyone. Uh, starting a bit early just so we can get those on time or slightly before time people on before. And as usual, I got some uh, juicy facts lined up for you as we wait for everyone to join. So first one, in 1915, the lock millionaire Cecil Chubb bought his wife Stonehenge. Uh, she didn't like it. So in 1918, he gave it to the nation. Yeah. Millionaires, eh? Uh, just like humans, British cows moo in regional accents. I really wish I could try and like distinguish yeah, an accent of a cow. I think that'd be quite cool. Uh, sticking with the British theme, John Cleese's father's surname was Cheese. Cleese grew up 10 miles from Cheddar and his best friend at school was called Barney Butter. So a bit of a, a dairy theme going on there. Uh, so attendees still coming in, so I'll keep them facts going for a bit. Uh, Liechtenstein, the world's sixth smallest country, is the largest largest exporter of false teeth. Ah, bit of a bit of a niche thing going there for Liechtenstein. Uh, and Michael J. Fox's middle name is Andrew. I'm not sure if that's with Silent J at the start, but um, yeah, we know. All right, so we got quite a tight schedule today. So I just want to. Again, welcome those that have um, come on as I was reading the facts to day four, the final day for Brain Trust. Uh, it's been, yeah, awesome th first three days, and I imagine the day four is also going to be awesome. And uh, before I kick things off, uh, I do want to share a slide that Dee Silthorne asked me to share. It's about uh, EB or experimental biology next year, which, like most things, including Brain Trust, has gone virtual. So uh, if you are wanting to submit an abstract, uh, that needs to be done by January 7th. As you're reading further details, I will put in the link that's on here into the chat. Um, so you can sign up to that if you wish. I hope that's enough time to have read, read that. So I'll stop sharing my screen. So I wanna be bringing on our first panelists. Uh, which is uh, Rob Carroll from uh, East Carolina University. So Rob's going to kick us off for the day. And yeah, Rob should be coming on any moment now. And while he does that, maybe I can sneak in another fact. Oh, no, here we go. <laughs> All right. Hi, Rob. Uh, we can't see or hear you at the moment, but we can see your slides. Look how much better when you click all the right buttons. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Cheers, Rob. Okay. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you're joining from. Uh, my name is Rob Carroll. I'm a physiologist by training and an educator by avocation. So I'm currently the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Medical Education at a medical school in the USA. And the topic that I'm going to talk about today deals more with my role in the entire curriculum as opposed to teaching an individual class or course. So I feel it's important that as instructors, you understand the forces from the outside that are going to shape what's happening to you. And one of them that is coming down the road is a shift from learning objectives to competencies as each of the courses become more of the component in an organized curriculum. So modeling good behavior, I've got learning objectives. Uh, so for this presentation, uh, at the end of the session, you should be able to distinguish between learning objectives and competencies based on their structure and application. This is also the time to introduce the concept of competencies. Competencies um, are knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and they're split into domains. So one of the competency domains is knowledge. For this presentation, at the end of it, you should be able to show how the learning objectives contribute to program competencies. A second domain for us is practice-based learning and improvement, which I'll describe later. You should be able to link your course objectives to school-wide competencies. And then finally, professionalism. You should be able to demonstrate the professional attitudes of a learner and a colleague as you interact with your learners and your peers. So to have a conversation, we need a common vocabulary. I always like to start off with establishing that vocabulary. So here's the definition of a competency, knowledge, skills, or attitudes that enables an individual to learn and perform in practice to meet or exceed the standards of a profession. 
That's different from learning objectives. Learning objectives are statements that focus on the instructional process or the specific content of a course or a lecture. So the learning objectives are the very granular activities. In contrast, the competencies are the global, the final outcomes that you wanna see occur. So the distinction is the competency focuses on the end product of the instructional process or it embraces that larger picture rather than the content of a single course. They are related. The learning objectives can be used to collect data related to the achievement of a competency. And for every competency, there are many objectives that must be met over the course of a longitudinal curriculum. So with that established definition, let's talk about competency-based education. Competency-based education is very much focused on the final product, the outcomes. Those outcomes need to be assessed and when you look at programs that have professional licensing examinations, nursing, physician assistant, physicians, dentistry, those examinations are designed specifically to assess the competencies. Another new piece of information potentially has to deal with Bloom's taxonomy. I would venture that pretty much everybody here is familiar with Bloom's taxonomy in the cognitive domain. This was put forth some 65 years ago. Less widely understood or less widely recognized is that Bloom's taxonomy also had a taxonomy for the, or for the psychomotor domain, also published at the same time. And then about 20 years later for the affective domain in 73. Same thing, it's a taxonomy um, and when you look at the, object, the objectives, this splits into where the competencies are. Cognitive domain is knowledge. Psychomotor domain is skills. The affective domain is attitudes. So this is not really a new entity. It's been around for approaching 50 years. It's just only now getting a good foothold within the professional programs. So one of the nice things that the Understand Your Physiology product does is it gives you the opportunity to do the compare and contrast. So drop your descriptions into the correct column. Here we have the compare and contrast of traditional versus competency-based education. So for the type of typical assessment tool, this area is how most of our courses are generated. They are set up more as a structure and process based. So the assessment is going to be single subjective measures. The assessment tool is a proxy. We don't really look at how someone performs in their work environment. The setting for the evaluation is removed. For our medical students, they want to be physicians. We test them by placing them in front of a computer and administering a multiple choice question examination. The evaluation is norm referenced. The timing of the emphasis is focused on the summative, the final examination, and we expect everybody to complete the program within a fixed time. Contrast this with the characteristics of a competency-based education. What happens in competency-based is there are going to be multiple objective measures. So in your programs, you may have heard a whole lot of use of the term a portfolio in order to understand whether the students have met all the goals of the program. The assessment tool is authentic. It has to mimic the real task of the profession. The setting for the evaluation is most often direct observation as the students participate in the activities of their prof profession. The evaluation is criteria reference. So let's go back and compare these two. In a norm referenced evaluation, the students are compared against a group. So this is where we end up with our standard bell-shaped curve, uh, the two standard deviations away from the mean, those type of things. In a criteria-based reference, it's do the students meet the required criteria to progress 
to the next task. One good example contrasting this would be if you're trying to make coffee in the morning. If you assign 10 points for each of the tasks that are involved in preparing coffee, so 10 points for plugging in the coffee maker, 10 points for getting the coffee out of the cabinet, 10 points for putting the right amount of coffee into the filter, the same for getting the water in the carafe, pouring it into the coffee maker, and then sticking the coffee maker under the um, drip spout to collect coffee. If you do, if you forget to put the coffee into the filter, you may score 90 out of 100 on that particular evaluation. For the criteria referenced, you fail. You do not have coffee. So criteria reference is looking at the final outcome. In terms of the timing of the assessment, competency-based puts more of an emphasis on formative as opposed to summative assessment. The simplest and clearest distinction between formative and summative assessment that I've heard compares it to a chef. When the chef tastes the soup, that's a formative assessment. When the guest tastes the soup, that is a summative assessment. So formative assessments allow you to make mid-course corrections, allow you to refine what you're doing so you get the product that you're going to end up with. The last of the contrast is the program completion. For competency-based, you stay and you work on a task until you have attained that competency. You do not progress without having attained the competency. That sets up a real problem in the medical education world. We have 86 new students coming in each, uh, each year. And I don't want to try and track 86 different progressions through our curriculum. My life is much easier if everybody finishes the major tasks at the same time, and then they move forward as a cohort. So the competency based has some flaws as you try and apply it to a professional program, but you're going to be seeing more and more of these types of terms as, as um, in the next decade in the educational system. I was really happy on day two when John Zubek put forth this graph um, because this is essentially everything I was hoping to communicate in my talk. What this graph does is it has the competency domains over here on the left-hand side of the figure, sorry, the right-hand side of the figure. The domains that they have selected are completeness, professionalism, and correctness. When you look at the criteria for completeness, for professionalism, it's split into teamwork, time management, participation in lab attendance, and then correctness is just correctness of the answers. So when you look at the final grades that the students can attain, some 40 out of the 75 points are awarded for knowledge, for the correctness of the answers. I don't have a problem with this. Knowledge is absolutely essential. But in addition to knowledge, there are other components that we would expect in the behavior of a professional. So when you look at the other topics, the lab attendance, time management, teamwork, and completion, those all need to be assessed. The other beauty of this graph is it gives a narrative description of what it characterizes each of, the, each of the grading points. So the students can look and see exactly where they are and why, those, why they landed in that particular box on this graph. So this is how you develop, a comp this is how you employ a competency domain and then have the students participate in this. If this same type of rubric was used across the entire curriculum, each course would provide an assessment of the student's time management. So when you look at the performance of the student at the end of the year, each of the courses that they participated in would have assessed their ability to manage their, their time. And then you can get a really clear picture 
of whether or not this individual student was challenged by time management or um, whether, whether their, this was one of their strengths. The other advantage is longitudinally over the course of their curriculum, you can see if, well, they had an initial problem with time management, but then as they progressed through the curriculum, they shifted more toward the five points instead of the zero or one point of the time management scale. So one of the things that Ryan did very effectively yesterday was to implement reflections into his talk. So I would like you to take a moment and reflect on what barriers exist at your institution to implementing competency-based education, and then take those and reply in the chat box. So take a moment and... So in looking at the descriptions from ASH, you only get one hour per student to mark and provide feedback for the entire semester worth of work. We have that same limitation, but what we do is we have the students self-assess before they come into us. And mostly it consists of you looking at their self-assessment and saying, yes, that's, that's what I saw too. Uh, the students are usually harder on themselves than the faculty member. Uh, the idea that students pro progress at different rates from D is truly a problem. And um, that's one that has running the curriculum, I don't want them to progress at different rates. Um, time, space, and funding, that pretty much covers all of it. If the program is going to value an activity, then the time for the faculty to participate is one of the real characteristics. Um, developing the metacognitive skill, um, Yes, the students are generally bad at self-reporting and assessing. And I've always, at least on the knowledge fund, I've always taken great comfort that the students have to pass an external exam. I'm not willing to let them tell me when they know enough to be a physician. I like the idea that they've got to um, pass it. So taking it further by introducing conditional passes and the students to achieve a competency. And that, that is one of the hallmarks of a competency-based education. So let's go back to the presentation. The reason for having that moment of reflection is changing attitudes is really hard. Knowledge is very easy. Skills, a little more challenging, but still manageable. Changing attitudes is where the real challenge is. It's hard to change, it's hard to assess, and mostly you end up relying on observed behaviors as an index of an attitude. So you can't really change how I feel, but you sure can change how I behave. Um, one thing we do with our students is we have them read the back of the North Carolina Medical Journal, where it describes the medical license suspensions. Those suspensions are almost never related to knowledge or skills. Those suspensions are all, most always related to professionalism. Professionalism is a key behavior or is a key component characteristic of a profession. So I give talks to the students over the progression of the year in terms of their preparation for the licensing examinations. And in the US, medical school is a second degree. So the students go through high school, then four years of undergraduate, a number of our students go out and have life experiences before entering medical school. We tend to like non-traditional students. Then you've got the four years of medical school followed by a residency. And then finally, they're out at the, the final end product of being a physician. When we look at our educational program, we tend to say we take what they learned in high school and then extend on that into the undergraduate. We take what they learned as an undergraduate and then build on that into medical school. So we tend to travel from the left to the right in this figure, which is exactly the wrong way to travel. What we need to recognize is we should begin with what is a physician. The role of the 
or the characteristics of a physician is what should happen in the residency. The residency is there to prepare someone for success as a physician. Medical school is there to prepare someone for success in residency. So rather than start from the left and think about our curriculum as building on what the students have attained in the pre-medical school environment, the competencies say you look at what a physician does for a living and then use that to try and determine what happens in residency. When looking at what are the expectations of a resident physician, use that to determine what happens in medical school. So the core competency domains in our curriculum are medical knowledge, what you know, patient care, which is what you do, the interpersonal communication skills, how you interact, professionalism, how you act, the practice-based learning and improvement, how you get better. And this is the one for us, which is the biggest challenge, getting the students to self-reflect. And then the systems-based practice, how you work within the system to improve healthcare. This is not unique to the US. When you look at what happens in Canada, the CADMED roles framework has many of the same characteristics. You can see it illustrated in this much more attractive graphic than the ACGME has put together. But these are the characteristics of what that medical expert is that we're trying to graduate. In a report put out in 2009, the Scientific Foundations for Future Physicians, and this was a report from Howard Hughes Medical Institute and AAMC, one of the earlier speakers, Dee Silverthorne, participated in this product. Uh, it established the competencies as a goal of pre-medical and medical education, and then wrote them down into what are the competencies expected of a graduating physician versus what are the competencies expected of a student who is entering medical school. The same type of focus on the final product was at the root of an AAMC establishing the core and trustable professional activities for entering residency. These are the expectations of a day one resident physician. What should you expect a physician to be able to do when the door closes behind them on their first day of residency? Their first day of residency is preceded immediately by their last day as a medical student. So this is then the exit criteria for the medical education program. So what I'm advocating is you look at your tools in a new way. How are you training professionals? As Tony was developing the Understand Your Physiology course, I really like the pedagogy that underlie it. So I was pleased when he asked me to be a little more involved in it. For example, this is a page from the renal section where it shows a graph of relationships between arterial blood pressure, renal plasma flow, and GFR. And then the question that they ask is, what do you conclude from this graph? That one single activity can be ascribed to multiple of the competencies. For us, practice-based learning in three, identify, interpret, and apply evidence from scientific studies. It also fun falls under the knowledge for practice. Use the knowledge of the structure and function of the human body to maintain body homeostasis. And then finally, because it is a narrative response, it tests their ability to communicate through a written record. So even an activity as small as just answering this one question can be considered to address multiple competencies within a program. The one competency that I really like is the ability to check the answer. This provides formative assessment in a low stakes environment and the ability of the student to respond to an incorrect choice provides evidence of their ability to incorporate feedback into this. So this goes back into creating the reflective practitioner. They need to be able to figure out what they've done and then um, change their behavior so that they don't make the same mistake multiple times. So for this presentation, 
I did have a learning objective. I wanted you to distinguish between objectives and competencies based on their structure and application. But there also were competencies. This presentation should contribute to a knowledge competency where you identify your program graduation competency, should contribute to attitudes, getting you to commit to align your teaching to contribute to those competency. And then finally, the skills, providing a framework to practice addressing the competencies in your teaching. And with that, I'd like to thank Liam and his team and Tony and everybody down at AD Instruments for organizing this gathering and salute everybody who managed to show up for day four of a meeting. Um, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Awesome, thanks Rob. Uh, so even though you just nailed the timing and hopefully didn't spend too long practicing nailing that timing, I did wonder, given that there was quite a bit of interest coming in from the chat, um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of people wanting to have further discussion, that I potentially might pivot uh, our schedule slightly and see if people want to continue the discussions around this topic, if you're up for that, um, because the next talk we have is pre-recorded, so we can be sharing that after the event. So wanting first to check that that's okay with you, Rob, and if so okay. we can, um, I'll launch a quick poll now, just uh, so people can, give their feelings either way if we want to continue discussions um, or go to the next pre-recorded talk. So a poll should be appearing soon. And yeah, Rob, if you did have anything else you wanted to, all right, that's pretty unanimous. Uh, yeah, people really want to be continuing the discussion or aren't too bothered. So I'm just going to end the poll there, um, even though we're only just over 50% of the votes. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen with uh, another rather important poll going on at the moment. Uh, yeah, so yeah. <laughs> start to put you on the spot there, Rob. Um, but yeah, it looks like we're wanting to continue discussions. So uh, I guess if people maybe want to be using the Q&A um, option to be asking questions or uh, potentially the chat. So yeah, I'll leave it up to you, Rob. Okay, so the willingness of teachers and some not ready to move on that is getting people to change their attitudes is one of my roles um, as the associate dean. And my attitude got changed by the fact that our accreditation board came down and said, you will do this or else we won't license your medical school. So my attitude changed pretty quickly and pretty dramatically. Um, there is going to be a much greater impact of the accrediting groups towards changing what happens. Uh, so for us, uh, it was sort of if you want to be able to work at an accredited medical school, this is the path that we are going to take. And my office's job is to make that as less intensive, requiring the least amount of activity from the faculty who are teaching. Um, so how do you draw the line between allowing students room to reflect and quickly learning, you'll give you the answer. That is, we have to, you have to change, you have to alert the students that you're doing this as well as the faculty. Because if the students expect that this is going to be a continuation of the talking head in the beginning at the front of the room, then it is going to crash and burn. So we enlist our senior students to come back and talk to the junior students about, no, you need to learn to do this because once you get into the clinical setting, nobody's giving you a lecture. You are on your own. Uh, you have to figure out what you're doing, where your gaps are and address them. So it became, we really consciously made an effort to take control of the institutional rumor mill and use that to our advantage to try and convince the students. Um, how do you assess this in attitude and distance learning. That we haven't quite gotten to there yet. The full immersion in distance learning is a relatively new experience for me. We always had our students in front of us um, and that became a real, that's, that's a real challenge and we are running into problems with professionalism, with other behaviors of our students. Um, because of the isolation that has been imposed during this. So do you have a map that defines the competency and outcomes? Yes, we have an extensive 
curriculum at. So for our competencies, our medical school, if you go to our university, the medical school, um, medical education webpage, we have the institutional learning objectives. There are about 30 of them. Every single activity and assessment that the students take is tied to one of those competencies. So we can look and see, have we assessed their ability to communicate enough? How often did it happen within the first year, second year, third year, fourth year? And what evidence do we have of our graduates um, that they've attained those? The, who developed the rubric for the competency-based education? Um, if it's the one that I stole shamelessly, uh, <laughs> you know, oh, did, is Zubek here? Did he, is he one of the attendees? I'm not sure where he got that from, but we, we have that developed for our institution and each institution is unique. Uh, so there isn't, there's not a one size fits all. Our school has an emphasis on rural primary care. So we have a lot more of the interpersonal skills working with uh, underserved populations and things like that in our competencies than say Harvard or Duke would have within theirs. Uh, John is uh, one of the attendees, by the way, Rob. Okay, so John, if you would, yes, if you could promote John to panelist, I'd like to know where he got that from and thank him for sharing that with me. Sure, just bring him on now. Um, and also just saw that Grant was asking um, if you're able to send that link um, as well before with the competencies. Okay. So the changing the attitudes, it really was through faculty development and things of that nature. Um, and we had some faculty who were not on board who are no longer teaching in the curriculum. So it is a change or the curriculum is going to change without you. You can't stop change. Hey, John, how are you doing? Good. How about you? Very good. Yeah, so no, where, where did that come from? I, I, I made it up <laughs> oh, really? based on a lot of reading and uh, just looking at a variety of other rubrics, uh, con context, and then the goals that we wanted to achieve um, to try to push the students in that direction. So we sort of made it, we made it up for the most part, but we have not officially validated it other than utilizing it with our students. Okay, it, it looks very much like it's part of a overall program programmatic set of objectives. So we wanted it. To, we uh, wanted it to look that way. Yeah. <laughs> How did the students react to having things like professionalism assessed for points? So I think um, you know, at, we 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 provide a lot of context around it. So it's not as if you know they know that we are looking for these things and they are commenting on them. Um, but I don't think they feel as if they're being, you know, um, I don't know, late, we're not laser focused on each individual component. We just want them to know that it's so important that we are evaluating this and we are observing it. Um, at the end of the semester, so at the beginning of the semester, they do a sort of a, a, a self-reflection, and at the end, they revisit that. And then as part of that, we reevaluate, and they grade themselves. So they give themselves a certain number of points at the very end of the semester um, out of 50, or I think we're using now. And then we actually evaluate it, and we keep track. So when we see things happening during class, um, we reward them. If we see things that we feel are maybe not as professional or maybe they didn't handle a situation very well, we might um, approach them and say, you know, hey, let's have a discussion about this. Uh, we give out uh, phys coins, we call them, physiology coins, kind of like bitcoins. And uh, when we see something that's been very professional uh, or meet some of the professionalism standards, then we, it's a physical coin that we give them. Now we give them digital coins. So a little bit different in that sense so we try to more or less uh you know reward what we see is good and then just discuss what we see needs work so one of the things that was very powerful in your rubric was the behavioral anchors the text underneath them that lets the students see exactly the behavior which has placed them into that box yep 
and that and we embed those into our LMS. So we take the the correctness information from LT, and then we 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 put that into the rubric, and then we put the other professionalism um, and completeness aspects in there as well. So, and then they get the, obviously they have the direct feedback, and then they can comment on it, or we can have discussions if they feel like something wasn't evaluated correctly on their part. So, very good. And I saw Dee's comment that the students always score themselves higher than the facilitators. We have exactly the opposite. Um, our students generally are a lot harder on themselves than we are, um, possibly because I beat them up so much as a small group instructor that they're used to it. Uh, so, I'm Elizabeth. Yes, um, there is a split there, Elizabeth. The highly competent students score themselves modestly, and the ones that are less achieved uh, tend to overinflate their sense. So that's why it is important to have that type of formative feedback for the students. We have a few questions coming through. Uh, are you happy reading them okay. yourself, or would you like me to read them out to if you? If you could read the Q and A, sure. I, I got the chat up. All right. Uh, so, top of the list is from Sanjay. Is uh, how did you convince your colleagues' attitudes? Uh, the dean convinced our colleagues' attitudes. <laughs> he came down and said, "You're doing this. Any questions?" <laughs> so, from the top. All right. That's a simple but effective approach, I guess. Uh, <laughs> next one from Daniel. Uh, check your answer function. Where, how do you draw the line between allowing students room to reflect and adapt versus them quickly learning that you'll give them the answer? And in two different settings, um, we, part of our faculty development was letting our faculty get comfortable with silence. So when I'm giving a lecture and I pose a question, a clicker question or something like that, if I don't get an answer, I stand in the front of the room and stare them down. Um, the, if, the, if I'm being silent, I am doing my job. So the silence is just a reflection that I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing. So there's no, a silent room creates a lot of pressure and by deflating that pressure on the instructor, then the students will crack. But if you crack once, they'll wait you out from then on. Yeah, I can uh, remember that when I was teaching. <laughs> uh, cheers. Uh, again from Sanjay. Uh, oh, sorry, that's a repeat of the one before about convincing colleagues to change attitude. Uh, so from Liz, uh, for your authentic in situ assessments of competency, do you have difficulties with the subjectivity of the assessors? and the logistics of setting up these assessments? Yes, um, it's a more acute problem once they get into the clinical side. The courses we use them in are pass-fail courses. So the students know that they are not getting, this is not gonna follow them into their residency application or something like that. That helps to diffuse a lot of the tension around it and also frees us up to give a more critical um, feedback than we would if we were worried about this showing up and following the students. So the, there are hawks and doves in all settings, all grading settings. And yeah, that's just a new uh, regular problem. When we look at the range of scores given, if we see someone who's a real hawk, we try and talk with them about where they fit on the grading scale. If we see someone who's a real dove, we lay out where their grades fit among everybody who's grading things so that they can see that, yeah, they need to either tighten up or tone it down. Uh, and there was this another um, end to that question. So we have tried assessments of professionalism in a small group setting within CBL, but issues regarding tutors' marks, too lenient, too harsh, or prevalent. I'm not sure if you have any further comments on that. No, and that's, that's unfortunate, but by showing the graders, the uh, faculty, where, where their pattern of grades fits in relation to the larger group, you can get them to recognize that, okay, yeah, I, I need to back off a little bit. My expectations are too rigid or too light. Yep. 
makes sense. Uh, so from grants, have you shifted the programmatic assessments with the shift to competencies? Not that much. Um, the components were already there. The thing that we've had to do was we like for our physiology course, the competencies used to be just knowledge. And now we provide feedback to the students on how they work in small groups, um, how they approach data, um, whether they show up on time, whether they're respectful uh, in inter interacting with their peers and their faculty members. We never used to give that type of information back to them because we thought that's something that belonged more in the clinical setting, but it doesn't, it belongs in our setting too. And when, when you look at the, how we handle our science students, our PhD and M master students, that is competency-based education completely. And so when we talk to our faculty, we say, we want you to make medical school more like graduate school. Uh, where you look at how the whole person performs, when you look at what they're doing, uh, you don't expect them to finish everything perfectly. You guide them in, as they develop skills and things of that nature. Awesome. Uh, from Mei Ling, uh, who designs the rubrics? Um, so that may have related back to John's <laughs> um, yeah, chiming in. I, but. I think that was John's yeah. question. But when you look at all schools in the US have them. So as you look at their websites, uh, you can get some ideas of the different types of rubrics that are being used. So uh, from Terry, back to the idea of high risk, low risk, how much value is applied to things such as professionalism? In a pass fail course, we actually have failed a student for lack of professionalism. And that word got out on the street really quick. <laughs> so everyone else tightened up. Yeah. They had to repeat the year because they just were acting out. They were acting in an inappropriate manner. I can imagine word got out very quickly. <laughs> uh, and from Ash. Uh, so this is actually directed yeah, to John. And I'm pretty sure in the chat, there's something going on about um, asking John to answer that question. Um, so I might leave that up to John. Uh, and looking at the time, that's probably actually quite good because we are going to try and fit in um, Ravi, who was uh, meant to present yesterday. So um, yeah, we will be squeezing him in. So I think unless there's any last minute questions or comments, oh, I might. Hey, hey Liam. Sorry, I yeah. just I've just unmuted um, John, so he oh, okay. can, yep, he can answer, answer that. Perfect. All right. Where you go, John. Which which question were, were, we, were you on with that one? Uh, so it's from Ash. Did you have any pushback from students with regards to the time management, e.g. being marked down, but having work or family commitments within that 24 hours? How is that managed? So, so everything we do is in context to something they will have to face in the future. So... In, in, in Michigan here, when they do an assessment of a patient of sort, by law, they have to have that evaluation done within 24 hours, right? So we're utilizing that as a way to get the students to manage their time better. So what do they have to do to prepare for that lab day for that submission is they need to do the pre-lab assessment. They need to work on their keywords and have all of that stuff ready so that when it comes time to do the actual lab, um, they will be able to submit it in a timely manner. So we've had no pushback. Andy. Uh, cheers, John. Oh, uh, we just got one just snuck in from uh, Irfan. Uh, our challenge when uh, to put physiology and faculty core curriculum, it is always connected to medical license exams. Uh, in the US, how is the proportion of physiology and medical license exams? It's only about eight to 10% but it's foundational for all pharmacology and pathophysiology. And when you, we survey our graduates to say which of the basic science courses prepared them for their clinical clerkships, physiology for the last six years has ranked number three. Pathophysiology is number one, clinical skills is number two, physiology is number three. So it doesn't matter, the students recognize they need to know physiology. Apologies to any non-physiologists in the group. Uh, so you don't need to worry about protecting your discipline. The students recognize the value in it. 
And as long as you relate it to what they're going to be doing when they get into a clinical setting, it'll take care of itself. Awesome. Cheers. All right. So yeah, that's all for the questions at the moment. Uh, thanks again, Rob, for yeah, the presentation and for being willing to yeah, continue the discussion. Uh, thank you for everyone that asked questions as well and continue contribute to the chats um, yeah and uh, for those of you that were wanting to watch uh, Charlotte's pre-recorded talk uh, we'll make sure to um, send that out after the event so you can still watch that